Hey, what do we got here, Roy? This is the new type power steering unit, Joe. I thought I'd go over it with you and Don. I figured, uh... Hey, let me in on this. Looks like I got here just in time. What's going on? Oh, hi, Tech. I was just about to tell Joe and Don here about this new power steering unit. A good idea, Roy. It's different than the power unit found on the Chryslers and DeSotos because it is connected between the steering gear and the front wheel tie rods. No drag link is used. Right. This unit we have here is used on the Plymouth and Dodge 6 models, except the Dodge Suburban. You'll notice that this is a one-piece unit. Uh, Roy, what type unit does the Dodge V8 use? Well, Don, although the Dodge V8 uses a different unit than that used on the Plymouth and Dodge 6, they are basically the same design and operate on the same principle. We'll talk more about the Dodge V8 unit in the reference book. However, before we go into a discussion of the principles of operation, we might take a look at the slight physical differences between the two units. The Plymouth and Dodge 6 unit has the power cylinder and the valve assembly combined as one unit. In the Dodge V8 unit, the power cylinder and valve assembly are separate units bolted together. And you'll notice, too, that the steering arm is connected directly to the spool valve on the V8 unit, whereas on the Plymouth and Dodge 6 unit, the steering arm is connected to the steering arm stud. Right, Tech. And, of course, the units are designed to take the effort out of steering. Right. And you want to remember, the driver still has the feel of the road at all times. Say, that sounds all right. The power steering units become operative whenever a slight force is exerted on the steering wheel. Actually, the amount of assistance given by the power unit to turn the front wheels increases in proportion to the effort or pull applied to the steering wheel. Mmm, that's good. The driver maintains full control of the car with an average light grip on the steering wheel. Uh, but what happens if the hydraulic power fails? Nothing, Don, except there will be a slight increase in steering effort over that needed for a car not equipped with power steering. But the car can be handled very well manually. Why don't you explain the details of operation using the Plymouth and Dodge 6 unit as an example? That's a good idea, Tech. Let's take the valve assembly located here at the left end of the power cylinder. The valve assembly consists of a spool-type valve, the outer and inner reaction pistons and springs, and the steering arm stud. The stud extends through the valve body assembly and is held in the center position by the reaction piston springs. Right, Roy. There are two replaceable steel ball seats which bear against the ball around the stud. They help to center the stud. Good. Now you want to remember that this is the single unit type containing the power cylinder and the valve assembly. And the heart of the unit is, of course, the valve assembly which controls the movement of the power cylinder. You'll notice that the piston is secured on the left end of this hardened chrome-plated rod. The other end of the rod is attached to a bracket on the right frame side rail. The rod is insulated from the bracket by rubber cushions. Then it's the cylinder rather than the piston that moves. Right, Don. The left end of the cylinder is attached to the steering gear arm by means of the steering arm stud. And the tie rods are connected to these two ball studs on the power cylinder and, of course, to the steering knuckle arms. What about oil for the unit, Roy? Where does it come from? from the reservoir and a rotary-type hydraulic pump mounted at the rear of the generator. The engine drives the pump through the generator shaft. Flexible hoses connect the pump to the power cylinder. Now I suppose you're going to tell them how the unit works, eh, Roy? Right. Now, let's suppose that the driver turns the steering wheel. Here's what happens. When the steering wheel is turned, the steering arm stud slides sideways in the valve assembly. This causes the spool valve to move away from the center or neutral position. Oil under pressure is admitted to one side of the piston. This pressure moves the cylinder, which in turn moves the tie rods and the front wheels. Now let's take a left turn, for example. When the steering wheel is turned to the left, the steering arm stud slides the spool valve to the right. The pressure port for the passage leading to the right side of the piston is open wider increasing the pressure on the right side of the piston. At the same time, the return passage port leading from the left side of the piston opens further, permitting oil on that side of the piston to return to the reservoir.
And this difference in pressure on the piston causes the cylinder to move to the right, turning the wheels to the left. Check. And for a right turn, the action is just the opposite. The spool valve is moved to the left. This opens the pressure port wider, increasing the pressure on the left side of the piston. And at the same time, the return port leading from the right side of the piston is opened wider, permitting oil on that side to return to the reservoir. Well, what takes place when the steering wheel is not turned? In the neutral position, Joe, no steering effort is being exerted on the steering wheel. This means that the spool valve is in the neutral position. Oil from the pressure side of the pump passes through the valve body and back to the pump. Right. And since equal force is being exerted on each side of the piston, the cylinder remains stationary. And, uh, Roy, will the front wheels return to the straight-ahead position when the driver releases the steering wheel? Oh, sure, Don. A small portion of the oil from the pressure port is fed through a passage to the rear face of the reaction piston. So, when the driver releases the steering wheel, the reaction piston forces the spool valve back to neutral, reducing oil pressure to the power cylinder. And as soon as pressure is equalized on each side of the piston, the steering geometry takes over and returns the wheels to straight ahead position. Suppose something happens and the pump quits putting out pressure. What then? You just steer entirely by manual effort. The arrangement of the pressure and return passages in the valve body is such that oil cannot be trapped in the cylinder and resist movement. That's a good point, Tech. Now suppose we talk for a moment about the oil pump and reservoir assembly mounted at the rear of the generator. The oil pump is a single rotor type and is driven from the rear end of the generator by a flexible coupling. Now let's take a look at the reservoir mounted on top of the oil pump. You'll notice that it has a cartridge type oil filter element and there's a spring loaded relief valve in the top of the filter element. A pressure relief valve, eh? When would the oil ever reach pressure high enough to force this valve open, Roy? Well, when the oil is cold, its viscosity is higher. Therefore, the oil will not pass through the filter as fast as the pump returns it. In this case, when pressure becomes high enough, the filter relief valve opens, and the return oil enters the reservoir without going through the filter. There is a small diaphragm vent valve in the reservoir cover to relieve air pressure that might build up in the reservoir. Right. And oil will come out of this vent, too, if the reservoir is too full. Rubber O-rings are used at the oil passages between the reservoir and the pump to prevent oil leaks. I see there are two flexible hoses connecting the pump to the power unit. Yep. And the pressure hose is a special two-diameter hose which was developed to eliminate harmonic vibrations sometimes present in hydraulic systems. Roy, uh, how much oil does the hydraulic system contain? It contains three pints of SAE 10W engine oil, Don. But hold it right there. Someone better turn the record over so we can get the rest of the story on the power steering unit. Now let's talk for a moment about the combination flow control and pressure relief valve in the oil pump body. Uh, Roy, is that the pressure relief valve inside the flow control valve? Right, Don. One valve controls the amount of oil flow through the system, and the other controls oil pressure. You see, Don... Since the generator drives the oil pump, you'd expect the pump to circulate a lot of oil through the system at high speeds. But with the front wheels straight ahead, you're not using the power steering system. So, when the circulation rises to two gallons per minute, which is the maximum flow, the flow control valve is forced to move against the pressure of the return spring. And as the valve moves, it opens up a passageway between the inlet and outlet sides of the pump. Excess oil then simply recirculates within the pump. How about an example of preventing excess pressure, Roy? Well, let's suppose you're parking the car against the curb. The engine is running a little above the idle speed, and the front wheels are cramped against the curb. That's when you develop pretty high pressure in the system, isn't it, Roy? Right. So when the pressure builds up to about 650 pounds per square inch, the pressure against the pressure relief valve forces it to move against its spring pressure. This uncovers an opening to the inlet side of the pump and prevents the pressure from going over the fixed limit. Uh, Roy, what's the story on the maintenance of the system? 
Well, to start off with, proper lubrication of the steering gear linkage and front suspension is important for any car, but especially important on cars equipped with power steering. Every 1,000 miles, remove the filler plug and check the steering gear. Add fluid gear oil, SAE90, if the level is below the filler plug hole. But don't use a pressure gun for this job, or you're apt to force the oil up into the steering column. Right, Tech. That's a good point to remember. What about oil level in the power system reservoir? When should that be checked? Every 1,000 miles or 30 days, Joe. And remember, before removing the cover from the reservoir, wipe it clean so no foreign matter will get into the reservoir. Then remove the cover and check the oil level. The level should be up to the level mark on the reservoir. And don't disturb the filter element. You don't have to change it, so leave it alone. Do you ever have to change the oil in the power steering unit? Not unless the temperatures are consistently lower than 10 degrees below zero. In that case, you put in SAE 5W engine oil. And when you change oil, bleed the system. Here's what you do. First, wipe the pressure hose fitting at the cylinder clean and disconnect the holes at the cylinder and insert it into the funnel of the container being used to drain engine oil. And that's the two diameter hose. Then, with the engine running, turn the wheels from extreme left to extreme right and keep turning the wheels until air begins to sputter out of the hose, indicating that all of the oil has been forced out. Then you stop the engine and connect the pressure hose to the cylinder again. That's right, Tech. Then add oil to fill to level mark on the reservoir, and with the engine running, turn the front wheels from extreme left to extreme right until no more oil bubbles appear in the oil in the reservoir. Key wrecked. Then add oil to fill to level mark again and install the cover. That's all there is to bleeding the system. And now you better tell Don about adjusting the fan belt, Roy. Say, that's right, Tech. The fan belt tension should be checked and the belt tightened if necessary to prevent noise and slippage. And that belt should be checked on new cars and at the 1,000 mile inspection. Right, Tech. To adjust the belt tension, first loosen the adjusting bracket bolt and pivot the generator outward to take up the slack. Press your thumb on the belt midway between the generator and water pump pulleys. The belt should deflect not more than a quarter of an inch. Then tighten the adjusting bracket bolt. And if you've got the special tool for adjusting belt tension, you can do it easier. This tool right here, Tech means. Right. Just hook the tool over the adjusting bolt lug at the top of the generator, and the other end can bear against the outside diameter of the generator. You'll notice that the lower end of the tool has a square hole to receive the drive socket of a torque wrench. So loosen the generator clamp bolt and pull out on the torque wrench until indicator points to 15 foot-pounds. Then tighten the bolt. This gives you a very accurate adjustment of the belt. When you test drive a car to check the power steering, drive at speeds of 15 to 20 miles per hour, making several turns in each direction during the test. When a turn is completed and pressure on the steering wheel is released, the front wheels should return to the straight-ahead position with very little effort by the driver. You want to remember, the front wheels will return more slowly on cars equipped with this type power steering than on cars not equipped with power steering. That's a very good point to remember, Tech. If the front wheels fail to recover as they should from a turn, and the steering linkage is free and properly adjusted, you may have misalignment of the power cylinder or improper adjustment of the valve. This diagnosis chart in the reference book will assist you in locating the source of the difficulty. Suppose I get a report from a driver that his car steers too hard. What do I do? Start the engine and idle it at 450 to 500 RPM. With the front wheels on a dry, smooth concrete floor, turn the steering wheel one full turn in each direction from center. Check the turning force with a spring scale. Now, if it takes a force of more than 10 pounds at the rim of the steering wheel to turn the wheel, the car does steer too hard. So you have to check the possible causes as given in the diagnosis chart. Roy, could lack of assist be in the pump? Yes, it could, Don. It's pretty easy to check the pump pressure. Now, here's what you do. 
With the engine turned off, remove the pressure line from the pump and screw this pressure gauge into the pump body. Then connect the pressure line to the gauge. And be sure all connections are tight before you turn the gauge valve to the open position. That's right, Tech. Now, start the engine and allow it to idle for several minutes to permit the oil to reach operating temperature. Then, with the valve open, turn the wheels. Check the pressure shown on the gauge while the wheels are moving. And don't hold the steering wheel in the extreme positions, or you may heat up the pump and cause it to score. That's a mighty good point, Tech. Now, if the pressure reading is greater than 500 pounds per square inch, the pump and power cylinder are working satisfactorily. It is unnecessary to continue the pressure check further. This one is above 500, so it's okay. If the pressure had been less than 500, you would want to know whether the fault was in the pump or in the power cylinder. So you'd close the valve and read the pressure developed by the pump. And don't leave that valve closed more than three or four seconds, or you may cause the pump to score. Right, Tech. What if the pump pressure is over 500 pounds per square inch? That means the pump is okay, so the difficulty must be in the linkage or the power cylinder. However, if the pressure reading of the pump alone had not shown at least 500 pounds, and the fan belt tension was okay, you'd remove the relief and flow control valve and inspect them for scores, dirt, and for score marks inside the pump valve bore. And when you install the valves, use new springs. I suppose then, if the pressure in the system is okay, but the car still steers hard, you'd check for binding in the linkage. Right. And if the linkage connections were free, you'd remove the cylinder assembly and check it, following the points given in the reference book. Well, that's a pretty good introduction to this new power steering unit. But you fellas be sure to study that reference book. Remember, there's no substitute for good, sound knowledge. Customers are pretty sharp. They know when a mechanic knows his stuff and when he's just bluffing. So, don't get caught with your pressure down. <laughs>